We may never know without a doubt who killed three little boys in 1993. Why not? Because all the evidence in the West Memphis Three case was mysteriously destroyed. Attorneys for the notorious West Memphis Three found out the hard way that it's going to be much harder to exonerate their clients when they got that news from the state of Arkansas in July 2021. Now before we jump in, I'm assuming you know a little bit about this high profile case, but if I'm wrong, no worries. In this recap, we're going to review the details of the case, then you're going to hear about some of the other unofficial suspects questioned by police over the years, and I'm going to catch you up on a few of the internet's favorite theories about who the killer or killers might be. But first, you need to hear the latest about the missing evidence. If you know anything about this case, you know the state of Arkansas imprisoned three teenagers for the murders. Jesse Miss Kelly, Damian Eccles, and Jason Baldwin. The case against the three of them relied mainly on a false confession, unreliable witnesses, and circumstantial evidence. No forensic evidence linked them to the crime, but that doesn't mean forensic evidence didn't exist. But at the time of the murders, the technology needed to collect it wasn't around. But it is now. It's called an MVAC. It's a wet vacuum process that can find more DNA off things like the victim's clothes and the shoelaces the killer used to restrain them. Even though those items were submerged in water and yes, even after all these years. The three teenagers spent 17 years in prison for these killings, one of them on death row, until they were released on an Alfred plea in 2011. What's that? Well, to put it simply, it's a very rarely used legal maneuver that lets defendants maintain their innocence and accept a guilty conviction at the same time. I'll tell you more about that later in this recap. But for now, it looks like the West Memphis Three won't get a chance at exoneration after all because as of July 2021, the evidence is gone. So now the question is, if they didn't do it, who did? Let's get into this. I'm Chris, and this is True Crime Recaps. I want to take you back to West Memphis, Arkansas on May 5th, 1993, the day of. It was a typical Wednesday, and eight-year-old Steve Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers were in school until about 3 p.m., although Chris was sent home early for acting up. By 9.30 that night, all three boys had been reported missing. The three of them were riding two bikes toward a place the locals called Robin Hood Hills. That's where their bodies were found the next afternoon. It's since been torn down, but back in 93, Robin Hood Hills was a heavily wooded area between a residential neighborhood, an all-night truck wash called the Blue Beacon, a Bojangles restaurant, and Interstate 40. You know how kids are. It was one of their favorite places to play. And now I've got to warn you, what happened to them is hard to stomach. But as we go through this, keep in mind that almost everything you hear from this point on has multiple explanations. With that being said, let's get into the details of the crime scene. For starters, it was so clean they didn't even know they'd actually found the boys until they noticed one of their shoes floating in the creek. When one of the search parties tried to grab it out of the water, he lost his balance and fell onto the body of Michael Moore. The bodies of Steve Branch and Chris Byers were together farther downstream. All three were naked and hogtied with their shoelaces, right arm tied to right ankle, left arm to left ankle, all three of them. Their killer had gone to a lot of trouble to make sure nothing was visible. Not only were the boys submerged in the water, but so were their clothes. They'd been wrapped around sticks and shoved into the muddy creek to keep them out of sight. Two sets of clothing were turned inside out as if they'd been pulled off someone struggling. The other set of clothes was intact, and that's not the only strange thing about their clothes. Some pieces were missing. Five socks and two pairs of their underwear were never found. Did the killer use those to clean themselves up before they walked away? And the boys' bikes had been moved away from the scene. They'd been laid next to a pipe nearby. But the area around the creek looked like someone had swept it up, and if there had been any blood there, it was gone. The most likely cause of death for Stephen and Michael was drowning, even though both their skulls had been fractured and their faces were cut and bruised. Steve looked like he had a bite mark. Christopher died of multiple injuries, including a shattered skull. Between that, the damage to the genitals, and the fact that they were naked, 
The immediate thought was that the boys were raped and sacrificed as some sort of devil worship ceremony. Why would they jump straight to that theory? Well, back in the 80s and early 90s, satanic panic was at an all-time high, and nowhere was the devil more feared than deep in the heart of the Bible Belt. In fact, the West Memphis 3 case number ends in 666. But the most horrific and possibly most critical piece of the crime scene puzzle was how they'd been restrained. Hog tying is a common form of restraint for hunters or butchers because it makes it easier to move the prey. And now we come to the forensic evidence, what little of it there was before it was lost. A few hairs were found on the scene, and this is where it gets even more complicated. One was found on a tree stump, and two were found tied into Michael Moore's restraints. But only one of the hairs from the shoelace knot was tested, but not until 2007, years after Damien, Jason, and Jesse went to prison for the murders. Did it come from his killer? Well, there's a somewhat convoluted answer to that, too. DNA tests revealed a possible match to Terry Hobbs, Steve Branch's stepfather. The other hair, the one on the stump, was a possible match to the man he said he was with that night, David Jacoby. But again, there are multiple explanations for everything in this case. His stepson, Steve, was friends with Michael Moore. It's possible that Terry's hair made its way onto the shoelace through secondary transfer, meaning either Steve or Michael could have picked it up at Terry's home at any time since the boys often played together. And there's another reason why those hairs might not be the smoking guns they sound like. Scientifically speaking, Terry and David aren't necessarily the only possible matches. In the immediate area alone, at least 30 other people could also be matched to the hairs, according to experts quoted by Oxygen's The Forgotten West Memphis 3. But, and this is a big but, those hairs definitely don't match the three guys charged with the murders. Other evidence that's now gone forever includes some fibers found on the scene that could have come from clothing owned by Damien, Jason, or Jesse. Some blue wax on one of the victim's clothing that police said came from one of Damien's candles, and which also helped support the theory that the killings were part of a satanic ritual. There was also a knife they fished out of the water behind Jason Baldwin's trailer. The kids weren't stabbed, so they couldn't say it was the murder weapon, but they attributed some of the cuts and scrapes on their bodies to the serrated edge of the knife. Today, most experts agree that those markings were from animal claws and not a knife. And, bizarrely, the knife itself had been thrown into the lake a year before the killings. But the biggest piece of evidence was Jesse Miss Kelly's confession. To this day, he remains the only person to ever confess. But before we get into that hornet's nest, I want to give you a little background on the three would-be killers. Most people in West Memphis thought Jesse, Damien, and Jason were real weirdos. Damien was 18. He claimed to be involved in Wicca. He loved Metallica and he wore black. He also spent some time in a mental health facility a little less than a year before these murders. Some people claimed he talked about worshipping the devil, drinking human blood, and sacrificing kids, and he had a history of committing petty crimes like shoplifting, all of which made him suspect number one. His good friend Jason Baldwin was 16. Unlike Damien and Jesse, he was a good student, but his friendship with Damien and his similar fashion and music choices made him an oddball. Jesse was 17, but he had dropped out of school in the ninth grade. He was spending his days working in his father's mechanic shop, but he was well known for his quick temper. IQ tests put him around a 72 IQ level, which is similar to a fourth grader, which brings us back to that confession. Obviously, it's a huge part of this case, so let's get into that now. On June 3rd, 1993, about a month after the murders, Jesse came down to the station for an interview. At this point, there was a $30,000 reward being offered for information on the murders. He figured they might give him some of the money if he came up with a story about what happened. That's why he waived his right to an attorney and was questioned alone, without even his father around. But even before the tape recorder was turned on, he'd been at the station for several hours. All in all, including the taped and unheard parts of the interview, he was there for about 12 hours that day. Now take a listen to an excerpt of his confession. This is the part where he's describing what Damien and Jason did. So you saw Damien strike Chris Byers in the head. What did he hit him with? 
he hit him with his fist and bruised him all up real bad. And then uh, Jason turned around and hit Steve Branch. Okay. And started doing the same thing. Then the other one took off. Michael uh, Moore took off running. So I chased him and grabbed him and held him. To, they got there and then I left. Okay. All right. When you get the boys back together, where are you at from the creek? I was up by the uh, service road. Or by the service road? Okay. Now, when this, when he hits the first boy, where are they at when he, when he hits him? Are you in the woods? You on the side of the big bow? You out in the field? Where are you I at? I was in the woods. In the woods. Okay, you've been down there in those woods before. So, Can you describe to me what in those woods, what's the location where you were? Uh, Is there a path you go down? I was down a little path. All right, where does that path go to? It leads out there close to the uh, field, close to the interstate. Okay. Stuff where I was at. All right. I was close by the interstate. When he hits the first boy, and then Jason hits another boy, and one takes off running. Where does he run to? That one, he runs out, going out the, out the park, and I chased him and grabbed him and brought him back. Which way does he go, I mean? Does he go on back towards where the houses he, he, are? Is he back. going to Blue Beacon? Is he going out towards the field? He Where's he running to? Towards the houses. Towards the houses. Where the pipe is that goes across the water? Yeah. Okay. He run out there, and I, and I called him and brought him back. And then I took off. Okay. Well, you came back a little bit later, and all three boys are tied. Mm-hmm. Is that right? And I took off and went home. All right. Have they got their clothes on when you saw them tied? They had them off. They had already gotten them off. When he first hit the boy, when Damien first hit the first boy, did they have their clothes on then? Mm-hmm. All right. When did they take their clothes off? Right, right after I, they beat up all three of them and beat them up real bad. Beat them up real bad. And then they took their clothes off. Mm-hmm. And then, they, then they tied them. Then they tied them up, tied their hands up. They start screwing them and stuff, cutting them and stuff. And I saw it and I turned around and looked. And then I took off running. I went home. And then they called me and asked me how come I didn't stay. I told them I just couldn't. Just couldn't stay for them. I couldn't stand to see what they were doing to them. Okay. Now, when it's going on, when it's taking place, <laughs> you under you saw somebody with a knife. Who had a knife? Jason. Jason had a knife. What did he cut with a knife? What did you see him cut, or who did you see him cut? I saw him cut one of the little boys. All right, where did he cut him at? He was cutting him in the face. Cutting him in the face. All right. Another boy was cut, I understand. Where was he cut at? At the bottom. On his bottom? Was he face down and he was cutting on him, or? He was. Are you talking about bottom? Do you mean right here Mm -hmm. in his groin Mm -hmm. area? Okay. Do so you know what his penis is? Yeah, that's where he was cut at. That's where he was cut. Which and boy was that? That right there. The, you're talking about the buyer's boy mm-hmm. again? Okay. Are you sure that he was the one that was cut? That's the one I said I'm cutting on. Okay. Right, do you know what a penis is? Yes. All right, is that where he was cutting? That's why I said I'm going down that. And he was on his back. I said I'm going down like that real close to his penis and stuff. If you remember, I told you that almost nothing in this case is as it seems, and that includes Jesse's confession. You just heard him say he saw Damien and Jason, quote, screwing them and stuff and cutting Christopher in the groin area. So let's go back to the boys' injuries and compare the facts. Yes, they were found naked, but they weren't raped. The anal dilation was part of the post-mortem process, not the assault. And most experts agree that their killer probably didn't cause their horrific injuries like the genital mutilation and the savage cuts on their faces. Those were most likely from turtles and other animals after they died. 
Even the shallow scraping cuts on their bodies were from animal claws, not a serrated knife like they originally believed. The injuries from their attacker was blunt force trauma to their skulls. Take a listen to one more part of this confession. Look now. At us and all that, I took off. Okay. And when you left, did you hear any more hollering or anything? No. All right. You went home. And about what time was it that all this was taking place? They called me about... I'm not saying when they called you. I'm saying what time was it that you were actually there in the park? I was there about 12. About noon? Okay. Was it after school? I let out? I didn't go to school. Well, these other boys... They skip school. They skip school. They going to catch their bus or stuff, and they was on their bikes. So, all right, they were on their bikes. Where were their bikes at? They they laid their bikes down when they came out there to the when they when they hollered for them, told them to come out there. Where laid, where did they lay their bikes down? That's what I'm asking. I don't know where they laid their bikes at down there, cause I was I was behind Damien and them, way way behind them. Okay. And when they hollered, then I seen the boys. The little boys came on over. Mm-hmm. Had Damien seen these boys before? Yes. Has he done things with them before? Or has he just been watching them? Has he's he had watching, sex with them before? Them. Has he ever had sex with any of them before? No, he's been watching them. He's been watching them. You mentioned earlier that at one of the meetings you went to with this cult thing, they had some pictures. Describe those pictures for me. It had... It has some houses, the trees and stuff. Okay. Had somebody taken pictures of these boys? Mm-hmm. Were they in the houses or were they in these trees when they took those pictures? They were the houses. At the houses. Did they take, like, one picture of one boy? It was in a group. Always three? It was a group of pictures of three. All okay. three of them. All three of them would generally be together. Mm-hmm. How many pictures did you see all together? I just saw one. Okay. And it had these same three boys in it? Mm-hmm. You're certain of that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Nate, did you say the boys skipped school that day? These little boys did? Mm-hmm. Are you sure? They was going to catch up, going somewhere, and like I said, David, Damien and them left before I did. I told them I made them there. And stuff. I had to get ready and stuff. I met them there. And it was early in the morning, so they went ahead and met, met me up. They went ahead and went up there, and then I kind of, you know, laid on behind them. What time did you get there? I got there about nine. In the morning? Mm-hmm. Of Wednesday morning? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and when, what time is it right now? Right now? Yeah. You don't know what time it is? Do you not wear a watch? Sit home. He didn't know what time it was when the attacks happened. Noon? 9 a.m.? No way. The three little ones and Jason Baldwin were confirmed in school until 3 p.m. Damien was actually at the doctor in the morning and Jesse himself was on a construction job. But this uncertainty about the time of the attack was chalked up to a theory that Jesse was lying to throw off the police. By this point in the investigation, based on the boy's stomach contents, the M.E. put the time of death sometime between 6.30 p.m. and 9. Now, I've got one more clip for you to hear. Were the boys conscious or were they... They was unconscious. Too. Unconscious. Okay. And after I left, they done more. They done more. They started screwing them again. Okay. How were they screwing them when you saw them? They were... Jason stuck his in one of them's mouth, and Damien was screaming one of them up the ass and stuff. Okay. Alright, and the one that they were cutting the penis off of, did any of them, or cutting the penis or whatever was being done, did they have sex with him at home? No. Did either one of them? uh, Jason did. Jason did. Jason was screwing him while Damien stuck his in his mouth and that little boy's mouth. Okay. 
how did he have sex with that one? They were, he was holding them down, right? Like, uh-huh. And Jason had his legs up in the air, and that little boy was kicking, saying, don't, don't, like that. Okay. He had his legs up in the air. All right. What was to keep these little boys from running off? If just their hands are tied, what's to keep them from running off? Well, they beat them up so bad, well, they can't hardly move. They haven't tied, had their hands tied down. All right, just you, sit on them. You said they had their hands tied up, tied down. Were their hands tied in a fashion to where they couldn't have run? You tell me. They they could run. They just had them tied. When they knock them down and stuff, they can hold their arms and stuff and, and sit, hold them down like when you couldn't raise up. And the other one, he just lays up. Okay. Hmm. As a reminder, the kids were hogtied, arms tied to ankles. They wouldn't have been able to move their legs at all. The rest of Jesse's statement went something like this. In the early morning hours of May 5th, 1993, he claimed Jason asked him to go out to Robin Wood Hills with him and Damien. They were splashing around in the creek when Stevie, Chris, and Michael rode up on their bikes. That's the moment Damien and Jason started beating and raping them. But like you heard in those clips, Jesse's main objective was trying to distance himself from his eyewitness account. Unfortunately, he didn't realize he'd be sending himself to prison by saying he chased down Michael Moore when he tried to escape. About six months after this confession, he was sent away for life with parole plus 40 years for making that claim. He also claimed Jason had a knife, and they used it to cut up the boy's face and slash Christopher's genitals. When the boys died, Jesse said he ran away, but the other two called him later that night to brag about it. He was also asked about worshipping the devil. He said Damien got him into it three months before the murders, and they used to meet in the woods where the kids were killed. And boy, oh boy, did Jesse have stories to tell about those meetings. He talked about the orgies and killings and eating dogs and about how Damien had been targeting those kids. When he was arrested right along with Damien and Jason, Jesse recanted his statement saying he was at a wrestling match in the next town over on the night of the murders. But it was no use. Their bacon was cooked. Technically, his confession was only supposed to be used at his own trial and not Damien and Jason's joint trial, but it was leaked to the local papers and became the talk of the state. That led to juror misconduct, which is reason number two for their release in 2011. It seems that some people lied about how much they knew about the case to get on the jury, and they were discussing Jesse's confession, something they were specifically told not to do. According to court documents quoted in Arkansas Online, the jury foreman said later, it was a primary and deciding factor. Hmm, it's no surprise Jason got life without parole and Damien ended up on death row. In fact, whether or not it was technically allowed into evidence, Jesse's statement was the bulk of the state's case against the three. There was no genetic material on the victims' bodies or on the scene linking them to the killings. And it would be pretty hard not to leave any DNA behind if they were doing the things Jesse claimed they did. So how did they end up behind bars for life? It was all about the circumstantial evidence and witness statements. I want to thank BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Is something stopping you from reaching your goals? I can get so caught up in stress and anxiety that I can't manage to even start a project, much less finish it. But after talking to my licensed professional counselor at BetterHelp, I have much more useful coping mechanisms to help me keep it together. With BetterHelp, you can message your counselor anytime and you'll get actual responses back. Plus, you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions online and skip the waiting room. And it's less expensive than traditional counseling with financial aid available. I want you to start living your best life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash recaps. Join over 1 million people who've taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now back to the show. From the minute they found the boys' bodies, Damien Eccles' name was top of mind. He wasn't the only suspect, but he was questioned more than anyone else, starting as early as May 7th. 
He denied even knowing the three boys and said he was home with his mother on the 5th talking to friends on the phone. His polygraph is reported as showing deception. Jesse's name also came up pretty quickly thanks to his neighbor, Vicki Hutchinson. She was a local waitress who found herself involved in the investigation from the very beginning. On May 6th, before and after the bodies were found, she was at the police station following up on a polygraph her boss made her take to find out if she was stealing money. Since her 8-year-old son, Aaron, was best friends with Michael Moore and Chris Byers, the police had a few questions for him. After talking with one of them alone, the police thought he'd seen his friends killed. According to Aaron, the boys had a clubhouse down there, and recently they'd been using it to spy on a group of five men that were using the woods to get high and have oral sex. Aaron's theory was that the men caught and killed his friends for snooping. As the days went by, his statement changed and got more elaborate. He implied he was there when his friends were killed, although his mother insisted he'd been with her all night. But it didn't matter because he could be used as an eyewitness to the killings. After Jesse, Damien, and Jason were arrested, Aaron's stories involved Jesse luring him out to the woods when he saw Damien and Jason kill the other kids. And as the weeks and months went by before their trial, his stories got crazier, involving devil worship, drinking blood, and at one point he even said he was forced to dismember Chris Byers. By 2004, he'd recanted everything, saying his words were twisted and force-fed to him. But let's take a closer look at one of his statements that happens to tie into a favorite theory about the real killer, the man at Bojangles. In one of Aaron's first interviews, when they asked him about the five men he and the others saw down in the woods, he mentioned a black man with yellow teeth driving a maroon car. So, let's explore that. Around 9 p.m. on May 5th, the night the boys went missing, a thin black man in his 20s stumbled into the Bojangles restaurant, less than a mile from the crime scene. A woman and her daughter saw him in the women's bathroom. He was covered in blood and mud and wearing a blue arm brace with white Velcro. He was wet up to his knees like he'd been in the water. By the time an officer responded to the manager's call, he was gone. They came back the next day and took blood samples from the bathroom, but just like the other evidence in this case, those samples went missing. And then there's Aaron's mother, Vicky. A week after the bodies were found, she volunteered to get close to Damien through her friend and neighbor, Jesse Miss Kelly. She even attempted to tape their conversations in hopes that he'd say something to implicate himself. When he didn't, she got creative. Among other claims, she said he drove her and Jesse to a witch's gathering slash orgy called an espat at the end of May. And somehow she managed to pass her polygraph when she was questioned about it on June 2nd. The next day, Jesse gave that confession you heard about earlier and all three were arrested. Ten years later, she admitted she lied about everything. Now, let's go back to the witness statements for a minute and talk about the Hollingsworth family. They were related to Damien's pregnant girlfriend at the time, Domini Tear. That's an important point because it made their testimony that much more credible. According to the mother, Narlene, they were on their way to pick up another family member from work when they drove by Damien and Domini walking down the service road near the crime scene around 9.30 p.m. on May 5th. And this is the kicker. She said the two of them were muddy. However, her husband, who was also sitting in front and would have had a good view, said he couldn't really tell who they were. According to her statement in September 1993, Domini said she was with Damien and Jason that afternoon until around 5 p.m. when she and Damien walked to the laundromat so he could call his mom for a ride home. They usually spent nights together, but that night they didn't. Still later, the prosecution speculated that the person Narlene saw with Damien wasn't his girlfriend, but was actually Jason Baldwin. You can see how easily these statements become a game of telephone, right? But did the Hollingsworths have another agenda? Maybe to protect their nephew, L.G. Hollingsworth? L.G.'s name came up in several tips right after the bodies were found, and that makes him one of those unofficial suspects I want to tell you about. He was 17 and friends with Damien, although in a police interview on May 10th, only five days after the bodies were found, Damien described him as weird and named him as someone he thought could have done something like that. 
Some tipsters said they heard LG wash the killer's clothes in a local laundromat after the murders, but when questioned, LG had an alibi ready, telling them he stayed over at a friend's house, a much older male friend, but whether he was there or not is hard to say. At first, this friend of his backed him up, only to later come forward to say he lied, and in 2001, LG died in a car accident. As long as we're talking about LG, this is a good time to tell you about some of the other unofficial suspects in this case. Mark Byers, Terry Hobbs, David Jacoby, and Buddy Lucas. If you've seen any of the many documentaries about this case, you'll remember Mark Byers as the tall, very dramatic adopted stepfather of Chris Byers. He was questioned pretty quickly after the murders, especially when Chris's autopsy revealed the imprint of a belt buckle on his back, which Mark admitted he put there the day of the murders. Apparently, Chris was grounded for acting up in school that day, but Mark found him riding his skateboard in the street. He also apparently gave a knife to one of the filmmakers, which was later revealed to have traces of his son's blood on it. He died in a car crash in June 2020. When it comes to Terry Hobbs and David Jacoby, there's no end to the debate about their involvement, although neither one of them has ever been charged with anything related to this case. Their names are linked together because David was Terry's alibi for the night of. According to Terry, he didn't see his stepson or his friends at all that night, and Steve's mother, Pam, was at work. But was he telling the truth? I told you, he was a potential match to one of the hairs tied into Michael Moore's ligature. That was revealed in 2007. At that point, he was questioned for the first time. Then in 2009, three eyewitnesses filed affidavits with the Arkansas Supreme Court to contradict his statement to the police. They say they saw him with the boys that night, according to CNN. Terry claims he went over to David's house to ask if he'd seen Stevie, and the two of them were out looking for the boy all night. David later said that wasn't quite true. He wasn't with Terry after 6 p.m. that night, so that's strange. And then there's the way Terry reported Stevie missing. This is especially odd. He took Stevie's little sister to pick up their mother Pam at work that night, although he was a little late. He didn't show up until almost 9.30. That's when he used the restaurant's phone to call in the missing persons report. But strangely, he didn't tell Pam her son was missing. She found out from her daughter while they were in the car waiting for Terry. And then there's Stevie's knife. He loved it and kept it with him all the time, but it wasn't found at the crime scene. In 2004, Pam found out Terry had it and never said anything. She said later she always figured the murderer had Stevie's knife. These days, she figures she was right all along since she's publicly accused her now ex-husband, although he's never been charged and still maintains his innocence. Then in 2013, even more damning allegations came out thanks to an affidavit from a man named Benny Guy. In the years after the murders, Benny and LG and Buddy Lucas confessed to killing the boys alongside Terry Hobbs and David Jacoby, according to News Channel 3 in Memphis. On May 5th, according to LG's confession, he was with Terry, Buddy, and David drinking and getting high in the woods when the boys surprised them as the sun started to set. Side note here, at that time of the year in that area, the sun sets around 745. Now, back to LG's story. It was Terry who told the others to get the boys, theoretically because he was angry that his stepson and his friends had seen them down there. That's when they were stripped, beaten, and dumped into the creek. In 2013, the attorney for Christopher Byers' family filed affidavits accusing all four men of the murders, according to Arkansas Online. So who is Buddy Lucas and David Jacoby? At the time of the killings, Buddy was a 19-year-old friend of Jesse Miss Kelly's. He was even mentioned in Jesse's confession on June 3rd as a friend of his who borrowed the shoes he said he was wearing on May 5th. Over the next few months, Buddy was questioned periodically, and eventually he implicated Jesse Jason, and Damien, too. Back then, David knew Terry through his wife, Pam. When asked how his hair might have ended up in the crime scene, he pointed out that he and Terry searched for the boys there that night. He also denies any allegations that he had anything to do with their murders. This podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. It's not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It's professional counseling done securely and confidentially online. 
Before we discovered BetterHelp, one of the biggest headaches was finding qualified counselors with appointments available in my area. Now, every place I contacted was all booked up, but with BetterHelp, I'm not limited to my local area and I was able to start communicating with a licensed counselor in under 48 hours. And you can't beat the convenience and affordability. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they are recruiting more counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting our sponsor at betterhelp.com slash recaps. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash recaps. Now, back to the show. Okay, so now that you know more about the case, the suspects, and a few theories, I want to tell you what the famous FBI profiler John Douglas said about the killer, whoever they may be. First of all, he suggested the killer knew all three boys well, which explains why their bodies were pinned down with sticks and their clothes and bikes were hidden too. The killer needed time to establish his alibi and the kids couldn't be found too quickly. So what was the potential motive? Punishment. And when things got out of hand, all three were killed to keep them quiet. The FBI profiler also speculated that the way they were killed says a lot about who did it and why. For example, if it had been a premeditated ritualistic sacrifice by the three teens, wouldn't they have brought weapons and ligatures to the scene? But the kids were killed and bound with things that were on hand at the time. Sticks, boards, and their own shoelaces. Let's talk about those bindings again for a minute. Part of the FBI's profile points to a person with a background as a butcher or hunter. He may also have a history of domestic violence, and only one person in this case checks all those boxes. Terry Hobbs. But despite the many accusations leveled against him over the years, he's always maintained his innocence and insists that the police got the right killers the first time. This is probably a good time to point out that today most of the other parents have said they believe the West Memphis Three are innocent. Technically, the three are convicted child killers, even though they were released in 2011. So how is that possible if they didn't do it? Well, that's a long story, but I'll try to keep it short. To put it simply, they all had to agree to the Alford plea, or none of them could. As a reminder, the Alford plea lets them say they're innocent while admitting the state has enough to find them guilty. They only agreed to it when they realized how long it would take to get another trial, and since Damien was running out of time on death row, they went ahead with the plea so they could be released. When they got out, Damien and his wife Lori, a woman he married in prison in 1999, moved to Salem, Massachusetts, home of the Salem witch trials, because of course they did. These days, they live in New York City. She works as a landscape architect, and he dabbles as a magician, author, and podcaster. Jason moved to Seattle where he worked construction jobs before moving to Austin, Texas to help start a nonprofit group called Proclaim Justice, which helps the wrongfully convicted. According to the Cinemaholic, he's hoping to go to law school. Jesse went back to his life in West Memphis, and not too much is known about what happened to him from there. We do know he was arrested in 2017 for multiple traffic violations, but he just had to pay a fine and he was released. At that time, he was working odd jobs and couch hopping. Even less is known about Damien's girlfriend, Domini. The most recent reports say she gave birth to her son with Damien, got married, and moved out of Arkansas. She doesn't comment publicly about the case. Terry Hobbs has been involved with drug charges, domestic abuse, and assault, and his name was removed from Steve Branch's tombstone. As of 2020, David Jacoby still lives in the West Memphis area. So does Buddy Lucas, although he's been arrested on a variety of drug-related charges over the years. And that's your recap. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please remember to give this a thumbs up and hit subscribe so you never miss a recap. It only takes a second, but it means the world to us. We're here every week, so until next time, take care. <laughs>